um, and then go home and die. Oh. Wait, what? Ah, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, well, for now, I'm I'm relying on Dayquil to get me through a day at least. But yeah, I may well do that tonight. Um, okay. But yeah, I probably rather unusual opening for anyone who wasn't in class and then watches this video. Um, okay. Yeah, let's get the diary going too. Um, okay. Um, before we talk about homework two. I want to uh, take a little time about uh, a few problems from homework one, uh, just as a post-mortem, if you will. Um, uh, based on um, you know having graded about 16 of these and seeing what problems uh, seem to cause the, the, the most trouble. Um, OK. Obviously, the very last one, day of week, is one of those. Um, but there might be some surprises among among the rest. Um, so, just a few comments about about these, and then we'll uh, move on from there. Okay. Um. Believe it or not, this this one uh, was was one that the, the class as a whole. Because what I did is I each each problem there were twenty five problems. I made each were four points. I gave partial credit um, and just looked problem by problem. Uh, I had Excel tell me uh, which uh, what what the class average on each problem was, uh, just so I could pinpoint difficulties. And yeah, this one number three, um, the class as a whole did not score as well. It seemed to be largely a matter of, uh, well, not following the directions. Um, so, um, uh, because uh, in problem one, one of the tasks up here was uh, computing the roots. Use a quadratic formula typed at the MATLAB prompt. That is not the same as typing in a command to use the roots function. Uh, the point of this problem was to actually uh, type in the expression for the quadratic formula, uh, like using the square root function, using a basic arithmetic operations, that sort of thing. Um, so, and by saying, as in exploration 1, 2, 1, do the same thing here to get these roots, which will turn out to be complex. Um, and then the other thing that a number of people missed, then substitute them into the equation to verify the correctness. So in other words, uh, you have... You know, your a, b, and c, 1, 4, and 9. So if you have your roots, you call them uh, x1 and x2, for instance. So you would actually type it a prompt, x1 squared plus 4x1 plus 9, to show that, to confirm that you really do get uh, 0. Um, it's a way of also confirming that you typed in the quadratic formula uh, properly. So, um, and I, I, I phrase the problems this way to, um, because there's certain uh, tasks I'm looking for you to, to perform. So when you take these shortcuts, that kind of undermines that. Uh, if there's other problems in this set where you're expected to use the polynomial functions uh, to help you out, um, so there's there's a place for everything. Um, so, um, so so a, a above average number of uh, points were, were lost on uh, uh, this one. So um, if you're not sure what the problem's saying, if, you, if I'm not clear enough, you know that does happen. You know. Check with me to, to make sure, um, and then I would, uh, if if that's an issue, then I would uh, update this here so um, everybody else can benefit. Um, okay, this one, um, where the uh, rand function gives you random numbers uh, distributed between 0 and 1, and the problem asks for um, numbers distributed between minus 1 and 1. A lot of answers um, still give numbers that are distributed in either 0, 1, or just negating them to get um, numbers between minus one and zero. That's that's not quite what I was looking for. Uh, like what I wanted was a matrix where numbers were just as likely to fall anywhere within the interval uh, minus one to one. And this involves um, 
like uh, taking the interval uh, zero one that uh, Rand uses for dis distribution and scaling and shifting uh, that interval. Uh, and that and for that you have to take into account what are the widths of the you know the interval that you have and the interval that you want. Uh, so that's the scaling part, and then um, and then taking interval and adding or subtracting some value to it to move it to the right or left. Um, so uh, these kind of uh, linear transformations, scaling, shifting, um, are um, are quite useful in a number of contexts. It's, it's one of those fundamental skills you need what, no matter what class this is. Um, okay, another one was uh, number seven, uh, using the lin space function. Uh, part of this set was about uh, where a case where I'm not going to take the time to explain a function to you in, like in a textbook or in class. I want you to get experience with looking at the help page for a function to see how to use it. Where, 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 where that's your primary go-to instead of uh, like me, for instance, or, 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 or Googling. Because I've, I've had to do the same thing uh, to look at um, MATLAB's help pages to see how to use a function um, uh, for, for like for, for first time, I'm, I'm still learning new functions myself. Uh, in fact, I will say that uh, from some of the things that you guys did, I picked up some a, a couple nuances. Um, so that, that's the sort of thing that that, that still happens. Um, okay, and uh, so the idea was how to you know these I've given vectors that are created using a colon operator. How would you create these same vectors? Using lin space, and the difference is in the colon operator, you're specifying a spacing between your values. Whereas lin space, you don't do that. You specify how many values you want. Now, of course, there's a relationship between the spacing between um, numbers in the vector and how many points there are. Um, so, so here you know the spacing is 0 0.01. Um, so, if you want uh, Values ranging between one and ten with this spacing, well, how many values would uh, that be? And uh, that's how you would determine what argument to pass to lin space. The default is a hundred, but then you can specify a different value. What I saw, uh, one good thing that I saw in the assignments I was grading is, it, like, I'm looking for your diary and um, where I see a lot of experimentation, trying, like, especially this last one, uh, which caused the most trouble, as expected. Um, Trying different uh, calls to lin space, different numbers of points, not getting it right, you know, comparing to what you, you know you want to get, until you finally get the right one. That's what I like to see. This is uh, so. There's, this is what's going to happen in throughout this course: is playing around with it. That's something you have to get used to doing. Is just bumping your head uh, against the wall, within reason, uh, to, um, to 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 get to get the right answer. And so these problems are designed to prod you to. Uh, to do that, instead of just trying to jump to the right thing immediately, because realistically, that that doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. Actually, life doesn't work that way either. Um, except there, the head bumping is often to an unreasonable degree. Um, okay. Let's see what else was there. Um, yeah, uh, with these two, especially uh, uh, number ten. Um, uh, yeah, looking for, for a. Um, Single statement. It's actually possible to write one statement that sets uh, rows i and j of a equal to rows j and i, so which has the effect of uh, swapping those rows and leaving the rest of a matrix um, uh, unchanged. And that's why I had that clarification here. The statement has to overwrite these rows with the interchanged uh, rows. Some people accomplished the that task, but took multiple statements to do it. So they didn't get full credit, but got, got most of the credit. Um, OK. Um, and then uh, dealing with while loops, there were two problems in while loops. Um, modifying this, um, where is it? OK. This um, script that computes the square root of 2 using Newton's method that we'll see at the end of a semester. And um, uh, so most people did number 16. I saw a lot of people simply not do 17 at all. Um, once you've done 16, that gives you a good start on 17. Uh, so that's probably the main reason why the average score on this was, was uh, lower. 
just because some people didn't do it. And um, of course, that's the easy, easiest way to get on my bad side, just not, not drive a problem. Um, there are a number of people who did do 17, um, but, uh, but not correctly. Um, they had the wrong, they did, because um, you have to have an and instead of an or um, to, to get that right, because you have two conditions. Um, if the, uh, as long as you're not converged um, and the number of iterations is less than 10, the loop keeps going. As soon as one of those conditions becomes false, that's when the loop stops. If you have an or instead of an and, um, then that, what, what can happen is the iteration may converge and then the, loop, the iteration converges but keeps going up to 10 steps. And you don't want that. You want to stop as soon as possible. Um, that's why I said use an and, not an or. Um, as far as uh, the last one, uh, number 25, um, yes, this one was definitely meant to be a pain in the butt. Um, so um, I um, actually had some misgivings about including it um, after, after getting it to work myself. Um, I thought, well, they're not going to have an easy time with it, but I figured, well, it's just one problem out of 25. And you know, someone if someone tries it and does not get it done, but they could still do very well. Um, but if someone does get it done, and a few of you did, um, then uh, definitely uh, something to be proud of. So, um, and what I what I did uh, since you know, you're sending me your code, so I just go ahead and save that, and then I, I just went ahead and ran it, uh, and I entered in some dates and um, you know check against the calendar. Uh, uh, like my, my iPhone calendar and making sure that you got the right day of the week. Um, and uh, some cases there were errors in the code, like I get an error message every time it produced a day of a week, but it wasn't the right one. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I had a feeling that you know, not too many people would uh, get this one in, in full, but I figure um, I wanted to throw in a, a little extra challenge for you guys. Okay, um, so the other thing to keep in mind for, um, uh, I guess one of the main messages for going forward um, is, uh, well, um, I've, I've, I've phrased the problems the way I do for a reason. Um, and the, those little details are important. If you overlook those, then you're setting yourself up to uh, lose points. And, and um, but, but the problems themselves are going to be challenging enough without those kind of shall we say, um, uh, unforced errors. Um, okay, now, um, I would imagine that some of you have some questions on homework two. Um, it, last time we still talked mostly about section 2.1, and there were a few other things that followed. Um, so what do you got? I'm not feeling terribly crappy right now, so I can handle some questions. For X bar G, Okay. Oh, yes, this one. <laughs> so I have an idea of like where the error is coming from. I just don't know how to rewrite it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, well, before we get to your question, um, yeah, one thing that would be a good idea to do that, that might help to describe what to do, and I think I already gave you this, this tip already, um, it's fine to assume that, like for instance, go ahead and assume that x is the larger of a two. So x is larger than y. Uh, like in, in um, absolute value, uh, because x and y are used in this expression the exact same way. They're squared, they're added. So, um, so it's fine to assume, like, for instance, x is, absolute value of x is greater than or equal to that of, of uh, y. Um, now this, of course, your question presents an interesting dilemma, because I don't want to give away to the rest of the class. Um, <laughs> uh, um, what is the issue? Um, 
that, that uh, actually leads to the overflow. But I will try to answer your question anyway. Um, and I apologize if this comes out too vaguely for the rest of you, but I think, well, about, well actually, I think it's a, little, it's a tip that'll apply any, even if you haven't gotten to that point. Um, so the idea is um, you want to, uh, so, so you have to algebraically manipulate this formula so that it's equivalent. Um, it, it, it would be the exact same thing in, in, in exact arithmetic. But the but it avoids the uh, uh, troublesome operation, um, or better yet, um, it's it's not so much the operation itself that's a problem. It's what kind of number it's being applied to. That same operation applied to a number that you know is let's say less than one, then it's fine. Um, so. Um, okay, um, but, but like but as far as what can what can you do with this with this expression? This actually this, actually this kind of expression squared of x squared plus y squared is one that students have used to cause their instructors fits in many math classes because of the algebraic abuses that happen. Um, because you think you could do some simplifying, like like for instance, I would. Uh, have a problem that features this exact expression, square root of x squared plus y squared, and somebody will simplify it to x plus y. Now, um, if it was square root of x squared times y squared, that would be correct, but not when you're adding. Um, in fact, the root cause, uh, through a careful study of um, lots and lots of homework assignments and several classes over the eight years I've been here, um, has led me to, to conclude that the most common root cause of mistakes is mixing up properties of addition and multiplication um, in terms of what you're allowed to do with, with, with what. So unfortunately, um, with something like this, square root of x triple y squared, there's not a whole lot you can do, um, but I'll just, I'll just drop the hint that... Um, uh, you can try uh, uh, factoring, um, and the thing is, I find my, like you often use factoring in cases where it works out nicely to factor something out. This is not one of those times, but you have to keep in mind that uh, factoring is not always for situations where it works out nicely. You can factor anything you want out of any of our expression as long as you rewrite the expression in such a way that compensates for what you factored out. Um, like to, um, like to, to give a particularly ludicrous example um, with this square root of x squared plus y squared, I can factor a um, I can factor a w out of this. Yes, there's no w here. I can pull a w out anyway as long as I put one back in. Really, it would be like uh, w squared into the denominator. You can do that. Um, and uh, I've done crazy things, not, okay, not that crazy, but things like along those lines that ultimately gets me what I need um, to do with that expression. So, um, okay, so, so there's your hint <laughs> uh, for, for everybody else, and hopefully that gives you an idea of where to go. Um, okay, anything else? Because you know, not many people, actually hardly anybody, has turned us in. So I figure there must be some reason for that. Like there's some struggling going on that perhaps I could help with. And no questions are being asked because... I want an answer. I want an actual answer. Like, like you haven't gotten to them yet. Okay. Well, um, because of, what? Right. But I don't 
Okay. Um, this is more like a what do you think kind of question. Uh, based on what, like for instance, if you understand why it would not be associative, what would cause that to fail? Um, and also why, what, why other operations have difficulties, like subtraction, for instance. Do you think that same uh, reasoning would apply to addition, to just plain old addition, and therefore threatening commutativity as well? Um, I mean, to be, to, um, for this to be completely conclusive um, would call for like, things that are well beyond the scope of this course, really. Um, but um, so so really, I, I guess I could say that um, uh, really the um, if, if you can show me that you thought about it, that that's really what I'm looking for. And a lot of times, because a lot of times that's what happens. Sometimes you don't really have all the information you need, but you're making your best judgment. Um, because I wouldn't want to get into like here's how an addition circuit works or things like that. I mean, we're, we're we're not doing that here because that'll make even me cry. But <laughs> so, um, but based on what you've seen happen in other operations, does, does is that an issue here too? And you know, I may get some people say yes and some people say no. But if if they're reasoning for either one. Uh, it seems well thought out. I'll give you credit for it. And there are no dumb questions. I just want any questions at all. Nothing? Really? Once you get around to this, you're just going to sail through it and get it in? I only have a handful of you um, uh, sending me questions. They don't have to be about 2.2. They could be about 2.1 2 also. So, I mean, um, I just figured I've already been getting a lot of 2.1 questions um, and more towards the end. But whatever you got, this is a good time. Yes? <laughs> um, precision matters. Uh, well, I, and I don't mean the precision of definition, but um, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm reminded of when during my first semester here, a student told me that I sounded like a math dictionary. <laughs> um, so. <clears throat> That student was also using that justification for why they were not asking me questions either. I can talk like a normal person when the need arises, so I just had to give me the chance. Um, now, um, I think a way to understand this definition is to try to relate it to something that you're already familiar with, and in this case, that would be scientific notation. Um, if you just go, I mean, th this is designed for any base, but you might as well start by trying to understand a different point of view of base 10. Um, and what happens is a lot of things that we just take for granted because we're so accustomed to base 10, everything just comes naturally to us, that all of a sudden we try to think in terms of another base, and then our brains slam on the brakes. Um, so it might be a good idea to really think these uh, things through in base 10 first. Um, and uh, to set yourself up to work in uh, binary, for instance. Um, because if I go to, um, and that's why the, the examples are important too. Like, you know, something like this, um, so a floating point number expressed in decimal, that's your mantissa. Um, it's when, when the um, decimal point is placed in such a way that there's only one digit to the left, um, which may or may not be zero, 
and then all of her digits to the right, that's the mantissa. Um, and then um, when you have, uh, and then you have uh, multiplied by your base, ten in this case, raised to some power. Whatever that power is, that's the exponent. Um, and then the um, the uh, plus or minus. Um, and this understanding this definition requires you to think about when you're looking at a decimal expansion like 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 this one. What does this really mean in terms of conveying a value of a number? Uh, again, it's something that with decimal is second nature to you, but I think it, some don't really think that through enough, and sometimes have have and especially I see this like in other classes like you know college algebra or something have misconceptions about it. Um, that if we take a look at because you all know that if I look at this number here, these digits are okay two tenths, three hundredths, four thousandths, etc. What does that mean? Those numbers are multiplied because they're to the right of a decimal point. They're multiplied by negative powers of a base. Um, and that's, so all of that, basically everything that you already know about the decimal form of a number is codified here. It's formalized in a way that really probably has never been done uh, in like other classes you've seen. Because you never, because you were taught to understand it, um, okay, I guess using the simpler words that you're looking for. Um, but because, you know, it's at an early grade and um, there's really no other way. Um, so, um, and in fact, that would be a good exercise, and that is if you have, if you just write down any number in scientific notation and try to pick it apart, what are, uh, well, I mean, I'll, I'll show you, I'll do it for you now here, um, that, uh, that, that these digits in this decimal expansion, the one here is, that's your D0, and then two, three, four would be the D1, D2, D3, up to the nine is the D8 because it's multiplied by 10 to the minus 8 um, in this, uh, this decimal expansion. Um, and by, um, uh, by viewing a, num a, a, a let's see, decimal number in that way, that paves the way towards being able to work with numbers that are expressed in, in a different base, because now it's just multiplied by negative powers of whatever that other base um, is. Um, like take this number right here, that's in binary as um, okay. So two to the six times one plus one times one half, uh, and then plus one times um, one over two squared or one fourth, and so on. But then the, the eighth digit is skipped. This is the sixteenth digit. Thirty second is skipped. This is the sixty four, and so on. Um, it it helps. I wouldn't say it's required by any means, but helps to eventually become familiar with certain powers of 2 up to a certain point. Um, so um, this might be the computer science background in me, but because uh, so, I can rattle off powers of 2 up, up, up to uh, 2 to the 16th pretty quickly. Um, but um, uh, but that's something I would just like happen over time. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Um, <laughs> be honest. I mean, uh, okay. Um, and um, now, um, well, well, I need to comment on some of these things toward the end of the definition. Um, that one of the things that you're not really used to from just working with numbers on, like, on paper is there's never there's never been any limit to in terms of representing a number. You may not feel like using a whole lot of decimal places, or maybe a certain assignment, like in, in a other science class, might um, uh, restrict you to, like, for first problem, use five significant digits or something like that. Um, but for the most part, you could use whatever exponent you want, or whatever, however many digits you want. Um, you know, if you wanted to, you know, try to memorize pi up to a hundred digits or something like that, you could. I once memorized e and pi to fifty digits, but I've forgotten it all. Um, and uh, but here in a computer, you have this rigid limit on how many digits you can store, what range of exponents you can have. Um, so 
Um, so yeah, really you could think of these digits in the mantissa as your significant digits, especially if a number is normalized, in other words, the leading digit has to be non-zero, then they fit that definition um, exactly. But number P, for precision, that is a hard limit on how many significant digits you're allowed to have in that base. Um, the exponent range uh, you know, uh, limits L and U. Again, a hard limit on what um, magnitudes of a number are, um, are possible. Um, and again, this is all due to storage, uh, just because numbers in a computer only allocate so many bits for the digits in your mantissa. There's only so many bits to uh, represent a certain uh, a range of exponents. <clears throat> okay. Um, but again, um, it's once you get comfortable with it in base 10, hopefully that helps with base 2, even though it's still going to be really weird. And um, unfortunately, with when it comes to definitions, I'm somewhat obligated to be formal, but that's why I try to provide more informal explanations, um, like in the examples here. Um, so, so, so make sure you take a close look at that. <clears throat> Anything else? We got time. Uh, which one? Okay. Um, okay. Define working right. I, I, I mean, I, I guess. I guess I'm just not understanding on what it wants to define. Okay. Um, well, really, um, just the, the equivalent of of this, but instead of dealing with with f. Um, you're dealing with F inverse. Um, well, um, but the, th the thing is, no, it, it's, the, key, the key is, this is what I talked about uh, when it's brought up last time, what roles each of these things play? X is the input, and that is C. Um, the um, the out, f of x, that's the output, and that would be x, which happens to be f inverse of c. Um, and then uh, taking care of a derivative up here. Um, um, and since the output is given by F inverse of C, that's where you use the differentiation rule from last time. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, and actually, if we go back to the question. Okay. Um, yeah, what I didn't include in the, the question, although in retrospect I should have, is um, once you have that expression, then, um, and this is going to be relevant when we get to solving nonlinear equations at the uh, end of the semester, um, under what circumstance could that um, uh, condition, relative condition number be very large or even go off to infinity? Um, that, that's something that's going to present a significant problem for us when we go to actually compute these things. Um, and that's why these condition numbers of are of interest. Because if they can get large, 
then um, we have to find a way to do something about that <clears throat> if we can, which is not always possible, unfortunately. Okay. Anything more? Um, yes? Yeah. Why do you use verbs and choose not to use that weird thing? Oh, uh, see? Oh, um, okay. For that, we go look at Taylor's theorem itself. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, so what we have here is, um, yeah, so the, in a Taylor polynomial, um, like, that you're carrying out as far as you need to for a problem, notice all the derivatives are evaluated exactly at x naught. Only the remainder is, is different. Um, and normally I just write this unknown point just as xc. The only reason I write it as xc of x here is that its value, this tree vote is, happens to depend on x. Um, so going back to this example, okay, so here, I've only used Taylor's theorem out to uh, n equals 1. So the first two terms, that's the first degree Taylor polynomial for this function um, at you know, this center and evaluated at h, and that's the remainder. Okay, from here to here. Okay. Um, all, right. um, all I did was um, it could because what? Uh, yes. Uh, because and the reason for that is um, when we're looking at convergence, we're looking at um, what it is that's converging minus whatever we're converging to, um, and then we examine that to see what is its rate of convergence. Um, and then, so, so, okay, so we want to see how big this could get, but since this is equal to this, now it's how big can this get? Uh, yeah, that, that, yeah the, it's, it's the limit you're converging to. Yeah, it comes from this. Um, yes, it is. Yeah, so it, um, and that's what happens in all of these, it, whether it's dealing with a um, you know, case of a sequence where n is going to infinity or a case of a function f of h that's going to zero. Um, we're looking at what it is we're trying to get to converge minus what it's converging to. And then um, Taylor series just help us get, a hand, get an alternative expression for that. Um, or that's what I needed to do in, in this example, um, which, as we've seen in, the, in these other examples, it's not always necessary, but it was necessary this time, um, and also necessary in this problem right here. Um, yeah, so that's what you're going to do. You're going to look at this minus that, use a Taylor exp uh, expansion of e to the h to condense that into something so that you can see how, how big it is. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Okay. Um, um, and because this was cosine, um, that that helped to um, get a handle on how, how big this could get. Um, so that's why we see that um, as h is getting closer to zero, we can say that the difference between 
f of h and its limit is bounded by this, but and this um, fits the definition of big O notation to say that this is big O of h squared. Um, and when we're dealing with h going to zero, we really only care about when um, h is small. So, um, so for instance, in um, this example, um, this line is is is, is important. Um, this will be useful in that problem that um, that you asked about. Um, so, because we care about only what's happening as h goes to zero, it's perfectly fine to limit h to a certain interval around zero, like minus one to one. Um, that is what lets you. Once you have your Taylor remainder, like the one you would get from this problem, impose a, you could say it's less than or equal to something. Um, because you like to have this, this minus the, like your, I'll call this alpha of h, minus alpha. You want to be able to say that that is um, less than or equal to some constant times a power of h. And that power of h indicates the, um, the rate of convergence. <clears throat> All right. Got any more? Okay. All right, but what that means is, you know, if you're um, working on this, uh, um, you know, we're going to this later, and you are banging your head against the wall. I want to hear from you. <clears throat> okay. Um, now. Um, Now, even though we have 21, 26 minutes left, um, in a way, you could say that um, what I'm going to spend this time on um, is largely centered around what you're going to have to do later for uh, for one exploration um, that comes in uh, uh, chapter six. Because what I talked about last time is if you're given x values and y values um, in the plane. And you're trying to find a uh, polynomial that uh, uh, passes through them, then um, you, know, you generate you know, from those x values this column, y values in this column, this divide difference table, and what that gives you is the uh, coefficients. It gives you a polynomial, and this is a form of that polynomial. Um, so zero order divide difference plus first order divide difference times x minus your first point, and then you have your second order divided difference um, times uh, uh, um, x minus your first point, x minus your second point, and that pattern continues. Um, but like I said last time, um, we like to have our polynomials in power form. That's the way that MATLAB represents them because it's a row vector of the coefficients in power form. Um, and uh, so here, here's a more general look at that uh, Newton form that the divide difference table produces. So all I'm focusing on today is if we have this form, an equation, uh, okay, this actually should have only one number, not, not both 6, 10, and 6, 11. It's only one equation. Um, I'll fix that later. Um, how do we get from this form to a form that's um, more convenient? Um, such as uh, power form. But the other thing is we want to be able to evaluate polynomials as efficiently as possible. It's the, whoops, what happened? Oh, this came loose. Okay. Um, because at all times, 
minimizing the number of uh, floating point arithmetic operations is, is very important. Uh, we, we don't want to be wasteful about that. So I'm going to take a look at something that in kind of like with numbers in your other math classes, you've always taken for granted. Um, you know, what was really thinking about uh, efficiency. Um, polynomial evaluation. Um, now I'm just going to make up a uh, polynomial here. Um, let's say, okay, something cheesy like that. Um, okay, now, um, so let's suppose you are given a value of x. Uh, we don't really care what it is. Um, and And you want to evaluate this um, using as few arithmetic operations as possible. So you obviously have to compute powers of x, uh, multiply them by the coefficients, 2, 3, and 4. You've got to add up all the terms. Now, um, but the thing is, suppose you carry out the evaluation of this polynomial exactly the way in which it's written. So you go ahead and... Um, uh, you start with 1, and then you go ahead and add. Uh, so I'm going to total these up here. So OK. Um, so, so, so at first, start with 1. There's no operations needed for that, so we haven't really performed any arithmetic operations just yet. Uh, so then you have a uh, multiply. You have... Um, uh, 2 times x, and then you add, so then you have 1 plus 2x. Um, so we've gotten out to here so far with uh, two operations. Um, and then you have, um, now, if, so if we go ahead and compute x squared, um, so multiplication for that, and then multiplication again to get 3x squared, and now you add, so we have 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared. Um, so now, so far, we've performed <coughs> three multiplications, two additions. And then multiplication again, um, x, x squared, x cubed. That's two multiplications there. Um, another one to multiply by the coefficient. And then finally, an addition to that tack that on the end. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 multiplications and 1, 2, 3 additions. It makes sense that the uh, number of additions would be one less than the number of terms uh, that you have. But we were not, this is not efficient. Um, what's wasteful about this, what, what I just did? What operations did I really not need to do? Oh, yeah, but the thing is, to add this on, that only costs one more addition. Okay, so, so, so that in itself wasn't wasteful, but something else was. It, it can't be about addition because... We saw from this, there's going to be three additions, and that's what, what happened. What about the multiplications was wasteful? Yeah, the cubing of x. Because I have x squared here. I didn't need to go back and compute x cubed all over again. Um, so I should hold on to that power of x. Um, so, um, so, so that's one thing that you can do. So really... We have, um, starting with x, it takes two multiplications to handle all the exponentiations. And then there's three multiplications by coefficients. So that could save a multiplication. Um, so that's, 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 that's one thing. But perhaps we can do even, even better, or we should try to anyway. Um, now, um, 
So let's take a look at can we um, rewrite this polynomial in a different form that would um, hopefully uh, might be able to cut down on the number of multiplications we need. Um, all right. Um, well, how might we do that? Like, okay, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this term here of a one. Um, how? Yeah, let's factor out an x. So we we have two plus three x plus four x squared. Okay. And yeah, so you can factor it out again if we just focus on these last two terms. All right, 2 plus x again, and then I have 3 plus 4x. OK, so we still see three additions. How many multiplications are needed now? Yeah, only three. So we cut them in half, 4 times x. And, and the reason why is we're multiplying each x by more terms that were previously added together. Um, so that makes a big difference. So this is called Horner's method for polynomial evaluation. And this is how uh, computers ought to evaluate polynomials. Imagine it's what polyval does. Okay. So you know, something you never think about, oh, whoops. Sorry, I committed a syntax error there. There should be an extra right parenthesis. But anyway, um, something to really think about if you're multi carrying this out on, on, on paper. Um, and, uh, but like I said, when, when you're doing your work, you need to uh, try to save operations. Because especially now we're, we're solving large-scale problems, a zillion operations are going to be performed um, anyway. But that's but you really want to make them count. Uh, because even though we can do them so rapidly, more operations are expected. So that, that efficiency um, uh, still matters because those demands are always always going to increase, um, even if it means for like more realistic animations and video games, for instance. Um, okay, now um, and in fact, a method similar to this, similar to Horner's method, is something that we can use to get our polynomial, our interpolating polynomial, from this Newton form to uh, power form. And it's this algorithm right here. It's called nested multiplication, um, which is really a more general form of Horner's method, um, where the polynomial that you have is not written in power form. We have these centers. So these values here in these linear factors, x0 and then x0 and x1 and then x0, x1, etc., these are called the centers of your polynomial. So Horner's method already it assumes that the polynomial is already written in power form. If it is not, where we have these centers, Horner's method is not going to help. You need this uh, nested multiplication instead. And as we see, in each iteration of Horner's method, there are n iterations altogether for a polynomial of degree n. And we have, um, we have a subtraction because of the uh, centers that are uh, in power form, they're all 0. We have a one multiplication and then this one addition. So this addition multiplication is what we saw in Horner's method. You just have this extra subtraction here. Um, but again, in terms of but what I mentioned before, multiplication is significantly more expensive to perform, like in the hardware, than addition or subtraction. I mean, division's a little worse still. Um, so saving multiplications is essential, and that's what uh, this method uh, does. Um, so what I have here, and uh, so this is something you should look at when you go to do um, the explorations in um, in this section, uh, 6.3, for uh, homework 3, is you have a polynomial like this after you do your divided difference table that's written in this Newton form. And in this example, the centers are minus 1, uh, I'll look at this term, minus 1, 0, and 1. And you want to get it into power form, you know, something like this. And so the question is, what are the uh, appropriate coefficients? Now, 
if you had this polynomial on paper and you wanted to write it in, po in, po in power form, you know, on paper you know how to do that. And if I would ask you, how do you do that? And you would just all tell me, multiply it out. Duh. Um, but what is that actual process? That's something, you, again, you, you do instinctively. But it's now a computer who's gonna, that's going to be doing it. So now you have to think about that that you've taken uh, for granted. Um, think about it more systematically. Um, so what happens is, here I have a third degree polynomial. And if I want to get this into power form, what you, what do you do, and this is what this example uh, fleshes out, is um, you apply nested multiplication, uh, this algorithm up here, you apply it to this polynomial three times. Now, it seems a little strange to do that because what is the purpose described here of nested multiplication? It's just to evaluate the polynomial. But while it does do that, it's not the only thing it does because your polynomial coming in has these coefficients, these uh, c's, so c0 up to cn, that are the uh, divided differences. Um, now this value y that comes out of this iteration is the value of this polynomial at whatever x you have. But along the way, um, these co new coefficients are computed, the b's, so b0 up to uh, bn. And those coefficients are an intermediate step towards power form. And then if you do this n times, where n's the degree, those actually are the power form coefficients. So here's what happens. Uh, so I'll, I'll just give a rundown on this example, but it's something that you, you ought to uh, take a closer look at or even try carrying it out yourself uh, later. So this is my polynomial to start with, with centers minus 1, 0, and 1. So I'm going to copy this. Oh, that did not go well. Um, things often go badly when you paste from a PDF. In fact, I think this might be unsalvageable. Okay, I'm just going to have to do it the hard way. Um, and I need to make this bigger anyway. All right, so P of X is equal to 3 plus, no, 3 minus 7 X plus 1 plus 8, x plus 1, and I'm going to make it a little clearer. The second center is 0, so I'm going to write it explicitly as x minus 0, just so you can see better. And then minus 6, x plus 1, x minus 0, x minus 1. So the original centers are in this order, minus 1, 0, 1. And the order is whichever one appears here first, then whichever one comes into play the next term, and so forth until the last term you have all of them. Okay. So what you do is you apply nested multiplication. So that's algorithm 6.3.6. Um, and now nested multiplication, you're supposed to supply an x value to evaluate the polynomial at. When you're trying to convert to power form, you always use zero. And the reason why is, um, I'm calling the center z in the example. So this nested multiplication is going to evaluate this polynomial at zero, but also compute the coefficients um, of, of this polynomial of new centers. So before the centers were minus one, zero, and one, the new centers 0 comes in as the first center, and then basically all the centers are shoved to the right. So then we have minus 1 and then 0, but we only have three centers because this is a third degree polynomial. So this last center, 1, gets shoved off the edge. It's gone, off the cliff. Oh. Okay. All right, so, um, so what happens is it's written in this form. So the first term, okay. Uh, 
and the nested multiplication steps are described here. And this is what comes out. So minus 4 minus 7x plus 14x minus 0, x plus 1, um, minus 6x squared, I should say x minus 0 squared times x plus 1. OK. Um, so this term, minus 4, that's the value of his polynomial at x equals 0. Actually, I need to, to stick with my consistent formatting. I'm going to write it this way, x minus 0. Thanks. OK. So now what are the centers? 0, and then minus 1, and then 0 again. Um, OK. So the polynomial, it's closer to power form. The first two terms are that way, but we need to go all the way. So apply again um, with the evaluation point z equals 0, and that changes the centers to, so 0 is introduced, then these two centers, 0 and minus 1, and then this one, this 0, falls off the edge. Unfortunately, the order has to be preserved. There's nothing you can do about that. Um, so what happens is um, I go ahead and apply a second time to this polynomial, and this is what comes out. So I have minus 4. Ah, dang it. Oh. No, it was fine. OK. So strangely, the minus 7 here uh, flips and becomes a uh, plus 7. 7x um, minus 0 plus 14x minus 0 squared minus 6 x minus 0 squared x plus 1. OK, and the reason for that is, notice the expansions look very similar. It's just that um, this term changed. Instead of being 14x minus 0, x plus 1, it's now 14x squared. And that caused a change, like downwind, if you will, um, to cause this coefficient to flip from a minus 7 to a plus 7. So we're almost there. Everything that I'm highlighting here, already in power form. Um, it's just uh, this, this last term is not. So we go one more time. The last time, uh, it's a fair degree polynomial. We need to do it three times. So it changes centers to 0, 0, 0. Well, when all the centers are 0, that's power form. So we get minus 4 plus um, 7x plus 8x squared minus 6x cubed. Um, so, and then you're done. Um, OK. So, um, so, so, that's, so, what, so what are you doing um, in exploration 6.3 point, let me make sure I get the right one, uh, 8. Um, you, you write code to carry out this process. So you're given um, p of x in Newton form center the, with um, coefficients in the vector c and the centers in the uh, vector x. Um, so those are the two arguments uh, to this function you're writing in this exploration power form. Um, and of a process is um, carry out algorithm 6.3 points six nested multiplication n times where n is n is the degree. What is the degree? That's the length of uh, C minus one because a polynomial degree n has n plus one coefficients. Those coefficients are stored in C. These are the divided differences. Um, suggestion Write a separate function for nested multiplication. So you can just feed it the um, coefficients, the original coefficients, 
and then the point you're evaluating at, which is going to be zero in this case, and then the output will be the updated coefficients. Uh, in, in the example, it's the, the b's that are uh, uh, popping out. Okay. Um, and um, so what, what happens is every time you carry on nested multiplication, new coefficients come out, then you feed those back into nested multiplication. Um, you, you basically keep overriding those coefficients. When you finish doing it n times, power form is uh, what you have. Keep in mind the order. The function is supposed to return highest degree coefficient first. And the reason for that is that's how MATLAB understands polynomials. The, as a row vector of coefficients, highest, it range from highest degree to lowest. So we want to we stick with, with that. Um, also, indexing. I mentioned this last time for divided differences. Uh, MATLAB uses one-based indexing, but a lot of algorithms um, use zero-based indexing. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, this loop is going from n minus 1 down to 0. So you can't use i by it as an index because you get an error at the last iteration. You would need to use, um, like, like if you want to stick with this loop that loops over these values, then whenever you use i as an index, you have to add 1 to it. Um, and, then, uh, and then things will work out like you expect. Okay. Um, right, so that's another thing to, uh, uh, to be wary of. Um, okay. Um, now, I know you guys are all, all mired in, in homework too, but unfortunately, I have to keep going, proof of material, so that when you get to this, hopefully before too long, um, you'll have this diary uh, to, um, uh, to help, you, help you carry that out. Okay. Um, now, there's one comment that's made in the text. I know I'm almost out of time. Okay. Um, that um, actually the process of converting the power form that I described in the example a little bit inefficient because we don't have to apply all the iterations of nested multiplication. And this is discussed in further detail down here right before this problem uh, that you can actually stop nested multiplication early. In other words, you, you, if you cut off the for loop early, um, then you'll still get the correct uh, results, but with um, uh, less work. Um, so, so that's something you can try to do based on what's the discussion given here um, as far as how many iterations you really need. And what you could do is go ahead and implement it inefficiently first, as described in the example, because at least you know that'll be correct, and then see if you can uh, figure out how, where to cut off that for loop and I mean specifically this for loop in nested multiplication, make it stop a little sooner, um, and then still get the correct result. Um, like you could try it out on a polynomial in this example, for instance. Um, and then you have a most efficient con conversion possible to, uh, to power form. So that's one of the essential ingredients in uh, this exploration where you end up developing your own polynomial interpolation routine. So while this exploration 639 does not require much work, it's really, the work is really done in uh, 638 and 636, um, it gives you experience in creating a more significant MATLAB program to perform a fundamental task, polynomial interpolation, using the most efficient methods um, available for this uh, general case. Okay, it's 5.05, so I'd stop. Um, so keep questions coming. On homework two, um, you know, and we don't have class again for five days, so I expect to hear from you in the meantime. Okay.